Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. And welcome to today's webinar, Storytelling for Active Transportation Advocates. I am Kelsey Carr, Communications Manager with America Walks, and I'm here with our Executive Director, Mike McGinn. The two of us will be your facilitators today, and I'll also be running some of the technical stuff behind the scenes. So before we get started, I want to thank our sponsors, including the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, for making these great events possible for us. And along with our sponsors, we want to thank all of you who attend and have donated to make sure this program and other programs continue to thrive. These are programs at America Walks that allow us to directly support local grassroots activism at the neighborhood level. So if you like this content, you're a regular guest here, we really encourage you to think about making a donation towards our webinars today. I want to make a note quickly about the technology. You should see a control panel like this on your screen. Um, that's where I'll be looking for your questions for our panelists today. So after presentations, we'll kick off a Q&A session. So please enter any questions that come to mind right there in the box. And if you'd like to use our closed captioning today, the link is also um, in the chat box. So our presenters are Tom Flood, bringing car advertising experience to street safety, Marion Human to present research results on language that works, Jorge Caniz, also known as Peatonito, creative earned media expert and filmmaker. So today's webinar is focused on how we can all be reaching more people with our message of the importance of walkable communities. So how can we better convince our desired audiences of the benefits of inclusive, accessible public spaces? Obviously, we have incredible data on how a culture that is dominated by cars, places that truly support our active transportation, can improve our health, the climate, the economy, quality of life. Uh, but data alone often doesn't carry the day. So we've put together this panel of creative and experienced communicators to share their ideas for how we can cut through the clutter, move people to action, and really tap into the emotional core of effective advocacy. So I want to thank everyone again for being here. I'm going to turn things over now to Tom, and we will get started. OK. Can everybody see my screen? I, I hope so. Um, First off, oh, let me see, show my screen. Here we go. Okay, I hope everybody can see my screen. And I'm just going to lower yes. these things here. Okay, can you see? There we go. Sorry about that. I want to close these down. So first off, thanks so much to uh, to Kelsey and Mike and the whole team at a at America Walks for hosting this session. Um, it's a real honor to be included here alongside the other presenters. Um, and everyone that's actually here today. So thanks very much. Um, I don't actually come from a transportation background or an advocacy background or a policy background for that matter. I come from the marketing space. Um, you know, it wasn't until I took out my two young boys to daycare and school on their bicycles that I realized how kind of dangerous our shared spaces were outside of the automobile. And that's really when the light bulb went off for me. Um, so I really leaned on creative as an outlet to kind of vent my frustrations um, to highlight kind of the imbalance and absurdity that we saw on the streets on our, you know, our daily walks and bikes to school. So that's a bit of about me and how I kind of got involved in this space. Um, let's see here, turn this. So as mentioned, I come from the advertising world and ironically enough from working on a few different auto clients and generally on the corporate branding positioning side of the business. So really telling the stories of the brand and the fleet of vehicles. So to me, um, storytelling is a really important part of communications, and it's something that we can really leverage in the advocacy space as well. I mean, we may not have the budgets or the reach as our large auto manufacturers do, but at its core, we can really develop and create messages that will both impact and resonate with our intended audiences. Um, we all know we've developed a pretty toxic car culture over the last number of decades, um, you know, and it's really been a campaign to essentially kind of demonize and dehumanize movement outside of the vehicle. So kind of knowing that as the baseline, there's an opportunity to look at um, advocacy campaigns from a, a rebrand position to rehumanize 
people outside of the vehicle and spaces outside of the vehicle and tell those stories. Okay. Um, but before we tell the story, we really need to remember who we're speaking to, um, and then we can craft our message that way. So this can be extremely nuanced right now, and that's thanks to so much data, so much research we have. We can be highly targeted, obviously, with all the online and marketing tools we have now. But generally, we know that when we're looking to create safer spaces and places for people outside of the car, we know that there's going to be a large group that is opposed to this. And this is not news to anybody that's here today, but I mean, that's because of 50, 60 years of you know, vehicular prioritization and catering to. Um, so anything that's kind of positioned as an alternative to um, the automobile is seen as problematic. And, and it's been framed up that way. And there's been a narrative developed that way over the last 50, 60 years. So it's really ingrained in people, even subconsciously. So this is the lens that we have to remember uh, to look through while we're crafting our messages in an attempt to kind of reach across the aisle and potentially turn uh, people into supporters or at least soften them, soften them and start shifting the perceptions of who people outside the car are and what um, advantages there are to creating spaces for people outside the vehicle. Okay, so that being said, um, how do we do it? Well, you know, there's lots of ways to do that, but this is kind of, these are three pillars I see in the communication framework that generally seem to be beneficial when, when communicating. So keeping things simple. If we're looking at rebranding um, our position, it's really important to stay focused. Um, you know, we all want to scream from the mountaintops the incredible, you know, environmental, societal, social, um, and economic benefits and impacts that complete streets and spaces for people actually have. But sometimes when we create too many messages or try to com communicate too many things all at once, it becomes overwhelming for the audience. And then that core message may get lost. So it's really important to pick a clear message and stick to that and focus on uh, the objective of what that message is. You know, a few well-crafted words can be, you know, just as powerful as a textbook of information sometimes. Um, and it's really important to remember, not you don't have to say everything all at once. There's a time and place, and you can say a few different things in different phases of a campaign. Um, next up, emotional. So again, the numbers and data are extremely important, important and really one of the key turning points to policy, but we can use emotions and um, emotional messaging to connect on a more human level, which when we're looking to reach across to people that may not be in the same mind frame or the same space as us, we can connect um, emotionally. So be that dramatic, be that funny, be that striking, uh, be that something nostalgic, whatever you feel your message, uh, the objective is for your message, pick the emotion that would resonate the best uh, with what you're trying to communicate. Um, let's see here, sorry. And relatable. This is probably the most important side of things. Uh, and one of the key pillars for me is we need to build bridges where possible right now. Um, unfortunately, uh, there's enough toxicity in this space um, that we really need to cut through this. We need to reach across and really highlight our commonalities with the people we're trying to reach, or those people that are potentially opposed to what we're positioning and, and offering and presenting. You know, we never want to frame up messages, bikes versus cars or, or drivers versus pedestrians. Um, it's just not helpful if the goal is to, again, to reach across and, and bridge those gaps. Um, you know, a respectful and approachable tone is always a good way to go if, again, we're trying to convert people or at least shift the perceptions of who uh, people outside the automobile are and what those shared spaces could do for all of us. It's you know, it's really hard for people to listen or to begin to empathize with you if they can't relate to you. Um, so I wanna show a quick video, it's only 30 seconds, and then maybe we'll just have a quick chat on how these pillars uh, apply in this video. Okay, so that was a, a communication called the school run. Um, and so if we look at the pillars we just mentioned, um, is it simple? Well, it's one continuous shot of a child riding his bicycle to school. So it's a really simple visual. Uh, the text is very direct um, and it's asking clear questions that we already know the answer to. 
but it's where we want our audience to reach their own conclusion to the answer that we're serving up for them. So it's clear and it's clear visually and the message is quite clear. Um, on the emotional side of things, what I was going for here was obviously a little bit of vulnerability because I think a child is universally seen as vulnerable. So a child riding a spike to school kind of evokes that emotion. Um, and if we look from a, a nostalgic point of view, I think we can all remember, many of us can remember, sorry, uh, potentially biking in our neighborhoods, biking to school, or going the act of going to school. These are things that we would remember fondly. Um, so it brings that emotion of nostalgia. And the last piece would be relatable. So that's similar on the nostalgia side is that we can all generally remember going to school, um, biking in our neighborhood, there's probably many parents that have children that would like them to be able to bike to school or have that independence that's been stolen from our kind of auto-centric spaces. Um, and, and finally, on the relatable side, showing a child is, is generally non-threatening. So it's not an abrasive message. It's not combative. It's really just a visual um, that communicates something that we can all recognize as a good thing. And that was my presentation. So it might have been a little quicker than I expected, um, but I'm happy to pass it over to uh, Marian Puman. Tom, if you could turn your webcam off, and Marion, you want to turn yours on or stay off, either way. I don't see a way to turn it on, so I'm okay. There we go. Okay, good morning. My name is Marion Human, and I'm talking today about how we move the needle on physical activity among Americans. I'm reporting today on a project that is seeking to look at communication strategies to help accomplish that goal. And the things that I'm talking about today can apply to active transportation as well. Everything okay, um, Kelsey? Yes, everything looks great. Thank you. Okay, okay first of all, this project is um, funded by the National Physical Activity Plan Alliance and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. This research is being done by an organization called the Frameworks Institute. We're examining the public's thinking about physical activity as well as the fields. That is what advocates and experts are saying and what the media is portraying <clears throat> about physical activity. I'm reporting results on the first phase of this project. The eventual goal is to develop a comprehensive core story to effectively communicate to policymakers and the public about physical activity. So relax. The, you don't have to worry about taking any notes because links to these reports are going to be provided to you at the end of this presentation and in follow-up materials from America Walks after the webinar, and my slides will be also. The methods that Frameworks Institute use included in-person interviews with members of the public, interviews with field experts, analysis of communication materials from organizations that work with physical activity, active transportation, safe streets, including America Walks, and then an analysis of media content. They coded 117 articles in major newspapers from major newspapers across the US. I'm going to report these findings as a series of six communication challenges with some recommendations. First, Frameworks found that the public has a narrow understanding of physical activity. They think of it as pretty much solely vigorous physical activity and exercise. In addition, the media tends to reinforce this idea. So we should be explicit that physical activity includes many different kinds of activities and certainly at varying levels of activities. They suggest that we give examples and tell stories of people doing activities that count like gardening, walking the dog, taking children to the park. The second challenge 
is related to the first challenge and that the public thinks that if you're not hurting, then it's not really physical activity. No pain, no gain. They recommend emphasizing that physical activity is pleasant and joyful and give more examples of what, looks, of what that looks like. Avoid leading with the discussion of how difficult and painful it is to work out. The third challenge is that the public tends to think that whether people are physically active or not depends on their own willpower and inner drive. The media also tends to emphasize that this is an individual choice, individual responsibility, and the motivation is within the individual. That means they tend to neglect the social context and structural factors that increase or decrease the likelihood of being physically active. So they suggest that you avoid leading a discussion of individual responsibilities. Lead with those structural factors, like the importance of safe parks and access to transportation, highlighting how environments both promote and inhibit <clears throat> physical activity. It's important to explain to the audience how systemic factors shape these opportunities. Don't just say that they do. Use terms like options, opportunities, instead of choices and lifestyle. But there is some good news about that. Researchers, practitioners, and other experts in the field, that's many of you out there, do emphasize environmental factors. In fact, 72% of field mater materials discuss structural level contributors to physical activity, compared with only 41% in the media. The field in particular tends to focus on ways in which environmental factors inhibit rather than promote active lifestyles. The fourth communication challenge is that the public thinks that physical activity mostly happens in dedicated workout spaces. So we need to strike a balance with uh, how fitness spaces, but also other spaces are where physical activity can occur. Again, give examples of activities that occur in non-fitness spaces, like walk and talk meetings, on the playground, cycling on bike paths, and of course, things like a miracle walk prom promotes, miracle walks promotes, as in your neighborhood, trails, um, and other places. Okay, the fifth challenge is that the public, the media, and the field all lack an equity perspective. And, um, so what they suggest there is to be explicit that physical activity should be a vital part of daily life and be able to be there for everyone, regardless of where they live, what job they have, and how much they make. I think this is something we really need to take to heart. They suggest that people need a step-by-step -step explanation of how things like housing, reliable transportation, and safety affect people's ability to be physically active. Again, not just saying that they do, but to provide those step-by-step -step explanations. Finally, both the media and the field focus on the physical activity benefits of physical activity, the health, the health benefits of physical activity, physical health benefits. So they emphasize to go beyond that physical health and really emphasize the mental health, cognitive function, and relationship benefits of physical activity. For children, field and media tend to specify that children need physical activity, but they don't link physical activity to healthy development. So we need to be making that link for people and um, how it affects overall development of children, as well as uh, engaging and making accountable multiple sectors, such as transportation, urban planning, and education. Our next steps in this project are subject to additional funding, and we are actively seeking that funding now. This phase two will turn these findings that you have seen today and others into narrative strategies, which will then be tested with policymakers, with advocates, and with the public. It's aimed at finding, helping people like you find these communication strategies to move the public discourse in the right directions. Our final deliverables that, we'll go, that they will be producing for us if we get the funding is strategic briefs and then a comprehensive online toolkit, which they call, Frameworks calls a framing playbook. 
These will be products to help advocates, researchers, organizations understand the communication challenges and specific framing tools and strategies. Here is where these reports are available. Again, the, you can find this on the slides at the uh, end of, uh, after the follow-up from America Walks, but also if you go to the Frameworks Institute, uh, you can find these as well. Thank you. And now I will turn it over to Jorge. Thank you, Marianne. I'm gonna share my screen. All right. So thanks, Mike and Kelsey. Thanks for having me here. And good afternoon, everyone. It is an honor to be on this panel with Tom and Marianne. I salute all the bicycle and pedestrians advocates in the audience. Thanks for your time. I hope this event is helpful to accelerate the pedestrian revolution in our cities using powerful storytelling story techniques. Uh, so why is storytelling essential for us, the active transportation advocates? We can persuade our neighbors and politicians to implement bikeways, crosswalks, completed streets, and so on. Storytelling is vital for community engagement, planning. Um, every community has its stories and it, it is important to spread them. Um, storytelling is probably the most powerful skill to raise funds for our organizations. And finally, communications is the very first step of every public policy. We have to be uh, on the public agenda in order to start the machinery of the government and build walkable and bike-friendly cities. Uh, let's remember why are all here together. Jane Jacobs once said that not TV or illegal drugs, but the automobile has been the chief destroyer of American communities. In other words, cars alienate us from our communities due to the loss of the human scale city. I have quoted Jane Jacobs to share with you one of the main principles of uh, persuasion, which is called the authority principle. As a speaker, I'm only a humble messenger and this walkable city idea is not a crazy concept that I just made up. We are standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, let's start with the rule number one of storytelling. Know your audience. The most important rule of them all. Um, this is what I call the audience spectrum for effective persuasion. On the left side, we have my friend, Bikey the Elephant. She's a radical bike activist who never drives a car and always carries a baseball bat to break windows of cars parked in the sidewalks and bikeways, just like Beyonce is doing it in this image. Then on the right side, we have Mr. Wheeler, an entitled car-oriented person that values more speed than human lives. His hobby is going to community meetings and sabotage bikeways and complete streets projects. Then in the middle, we have all the moderate or indifferent people. I guess that all the people in this webinar are here somewhere on the spectrum in the left side. Uh, these these uh, circles are Venn diagrams and the area in the intersections uh, is what active transportation advocates have in common with the audience. For instance, on, the, on one side of the spectrum, we are just preaching to the choir. We, we used to do this all the time. And on the other side of the spectrum, we are wasting our time talking with people that we, are, we will never convince. So we must concentrate on all the audience in the middle, our potential, our potential allies in this revolution. And the way to convince these people is to find out what is inside this sweet point things that we have in common. Here is la piece of resistance to persuade our audience. Rule number two, your audience is always smarter than you. This is what the Greek philosopher Aristotle called ethos, which basically means the messenger's values. We have to be humble and honest. Nobody likes arrogant people 
we are not going to convince anyone with a pretentious attitude. People love vulnerability, authenticity, and honesty. That's the credibility of the messenger. Rule number three, prepare arguments with data and reliable sources. Our friend Aristotle named this concept as, as the logos, logic and reason. Numbers don't, don't lie, and numbers are essential to winning an argument. For instance, nobody can deny that at least 14 pedestrians die every day in the US, and that every year more and more pedestrians are dying in our streets. Rule number four, tell a good story. Um, Aristotle called these the pathos. Stories are, the, are, pers are, stories are more persuasive than data, this emotional part of, the, of this rhetoric strategy. Uh, my professor of persuasion, Gary Oren, told us thousands of times, never tell a statistic without a story. So let me tell you a story. This is my grandmother, mi abuelita. She was a strong woman that escaped from domestic violence and migrated to all alone to New York City without speaking a word of English. After many years of working there, she moved to Mexico City and spent the rest of her life here in my hometown. She passed away five years ago due to Alzheimer. I did my research and according to the trans Translational Psychiatry Journal, it turns that air pollution may contribute to Alzheimer and dementia. Therefore, it is possible that pollution caused by motorized vehicles killed my grandmother. Today, 5.8 million Americans have Alzheimer's disease. Who would have thought that cars are also destroying our brains, right? It is time to be strong, just like my grandmother, and build livable cities with clean air. That was the story of my grandmother. And as, as you can see, I use a, a statistic, um, and that is the pathos with the logos together, a statistic and a story. A great example of data and stories together is the book Right of Way by Angie Schmidt. I highly recommend this book. She starts every chapter with the story of a pedestrian tragedy, and then she tells all the data behind it. All right, to sum up, every time you want to convince an authority or a neighbor to build a walkable and bike-friendly city, remember the three lessons from Aristotle. Be honest, the ethos, prepare your data, logos and tell a good story, the pathos. Now, the question is how to tell a good story? Let me walk you through the basics of storytelling. First of all, you need to be clear about who, is, who your protagonist is and your antagonist. In my story, the protagonist was my grandmother and the antagonist uh, is the motorized vehicles polluting the air. As pedestrian and bicycle advocates, we have our heroes and anti-heroes. For instance, Jane Jacobs, Jan Gale, Janet Sadikan are, are our heroes. And on the dark side, Le Corbusier, Robert Moses, and the Koch brothers. For instance, um, this is an excellent image by Bart Hawkins, a pedestrian advocate. This image is powerful. We have a protagonist, the fearless girl, and the antagonist an SUV, a potential killer. So every story has uh, three acts. It starts when one presents the protagonist and the antagonist, then act two, the conflict begins, and it starts the hero's journey. Once we reach the climax, we end with the outcome, the redemption of our protagonist. There is another dimension of a, of a story that looks like this orange line. The best speeches in the world look like this. You present a problem and a solution, another problem and another solution, tension and release, and again, tension. Good stories are like a roller coaster. You go up and down all the time. Problem, solution, tension, release. I have just made up this metaphor for this presentation. Metaphors are powerful because they, they are sticky. For example, this is a compelling metaphor used by many transportation planners. Increasing lanes to ease traffic is like buying bigger pants to lose weight. Finally, I would like to end 
by sharing these images of a short film that I'm, I'm making with my friends of the organization Los Angeles Walks. In this film, we start presenting the context, act one. The protagonist, Piatonito, is walking and taking a red car in a walkable Los Angeles back in, 19, in the 1940s. Then we present the antagonist, a bulldozer representing all the bad decisions of making a city for cars and not for the people. Then act two starts and the hero's journey starts. This is the section of the film where we present all the data about pedestrian fatalities in LA. Then Piatonito and the people of LA raise their voices and start the pedestrian revolution. The film climax is this morphing of the street from a car-centric nightmare to a people-oriented paradise. And the film ends with people taking the streets of LA, spreading the pedestrian revolution as a call to action. And that's today's last rule. Always, always, always end your story with a call to action. And this is my call to action for this presentation. Everybody has powerful stories. You behind this screen, you have a powerful story. A story by a story, we will build together walkable and bike-friendly communities. See you in the streets to share our stories. Thank you very much and Viva la Pedestrian Revolution. Okay, let's see. Hey there, everyone. I think I'm here. Um, was that it, Jorge? Presentation done? That's it. Okay. So, uh, Tom and Marion, why don't you join us? And Jorge, if you could turn off your presentation, that'd be great. So, we can just be on the screen. Um, I don't know the degree to which the people on the webinar understand that the, uh, the the slides that Jorge showed, the visual slides of the comic book, uh, Piatonito taking on the, the auto-centric world, it, it weren't merely slides, it's actually uh, what Jorge has done. Jorge, say, tell us a little bit about what you've done. Just take a minute or two to, to tell us why you're wearing the mask and how you came by your nickname. Sure, Mike. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a funny story because, you know, in, 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 in Mexico, you know, the Lucha Libre, like Mexican wrestling, it's, it's very famous. It, and we all Mexicans love to go to watch the, the wrestling. And um, so, so I was already a pedestrian advocate. So I went to, one, to the arena to watch a, a Lucha Libre match. And, and I told to my best friend, we, we should buy a mask and a cape and go out to the streets to, to, to help pedestrians, you know? And it, it turns to be like a very powerful way to communicate the message, you know? Like, Petonito um, will never change the city. It's, it's about the message, you know? We, we, we have to be all together. And, 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 and that's why communication is very important. I think, and I, I think to have like a persona character is very powerful to, 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 to explain this message not only to the professionals, but also to, 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 to all the people. Well, so if you want to learn more about Jorge's pedestrian advocacy, you can go to streetfilms.org. You can look up uh, Piatonito. Um, and uh, the, he's, I think he's got three street films about him. So, um, so that puts him ahead of all of us in this show. I actually have one. I, I thought I made it in the world when I did that. So I'm Mike McGinn, the executive director of America Walks. And and I was particularly interested in this one because I, I was um, a volunteer in the Sierra Club. I founded my own nonprofit. I was involved in many advocacy campaigns, public education campaigns, and then ultimately a political campaign when I ran for and won a race for the mayor of Seattle. And uh, so, and it's interesting if you're an advocate too, if you're, if, you, if you're on this, I presume you're here because you're like, how do I convince people of the rightness of my cause? It seems so darn hard. And, and I was just struck by that there were things at different ends of the spectrum here, like 
like when I was watching yours, uh, Jorge, having the call to action, like in some ways it's targeted, even though you say you're thinking about who's your audience, in some ways it's targeted for the ones that are very near allies to you to join the cause, right? And and whereas, you know, at the other end of the spectrum, Tom, yours was more, how do we take people who seem to have hard hearts and soften them, you know, get them from no to undecided? I'm not sure that's a question, but I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that. Tom, why don't you start and let me, mm -hmm. what, when I say that. Yeah, I mean, for me, I guess in the, the piece that I just showed there with the, the kid biking to school, it's, there isn't um, a call to action. There is, it's open-ended. Um, but again, it's, it's always about what's the objective of the piece. The objective for that was just for people to question themselves on the narratives that, that, have, that have been pushed for so long. Um, of course, this child's not an anti-car radical. Of course he's not, but he still needs a safe way to get, get to school. So it just, it was open-ended so the, the, the audience could find the answer themselves, which we just led them directly to. So yeah. important to know that, as, as Hori said, the call to action is extremely important. For this piece <laughs> specifically, it was just the other side. The call to act, there wasn't a call to action, but it was um, a response we were trying to invoke. Good point, so that's the similarity. Jorge, your your thoughts on um, you know activation versus persuasion, I guess would be the what I was looking at there. Okay. All right. Yes, uh, activation versus persuasion. Yeah, I mean it's it's always good to preach to the choir because we we need this energy between the. Uh, pedestrian and bicycle advocates, you know? We need to, to never give up and still in the fight. So that, that's, that's why it, it, activation is good and, 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 and be with your community and have a stronger community. But, but if, we, if we want to win the streets and if we want to change the streets, we, we need to also convince more people, to, to, to convince all these people in the middle that I showed in my spectrum. Because, you know, like car oriented people, uh, there are some people that we will never convince and we, we have to stop wasting our time there. Like, stop discussing with people on Twitter without a sense, you know, like, uh, we need to, there's a lot of people in the middle that they, they can be in our side and make the revolution with us. You know, it's, it's only a matter of, 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 of telling good stories to them of what is important for them, you know? So, uh Here's more of an open question, and and um, is I, I think that everybody is already a storyteller, right? In our own lives, we're just natural storytellers. We have to be, and people love to be. And and maybe I'm just relating my own experience. Whenever you start a campaign, everybody wants to sit down and talk about the message of the campaign, and that and that might be all they talk about, not all the other tactics. Um, but we are all messengers, and we all have strong opinions about what messages work and why. But here's my question: What are what are some of the pitfalls that people think might work, but really doesn't work, or they think might be a strong message, but what should they be examining? And Marion, I'll throw it to you first. You know, given the the work that you guys did on you know focus grouping and actually talking to people about what messages worked and what messages were not as good. It was a surprise to us that there was no silver bullet that was found among the research that could move the needle on physical activity. The things that I presented today are things that we've known about for a long time and we're trying to find now ways to say them in different, in different, a different cultural perspective. So um, there's so many things that are being done right, like the Let's Move campaign that Michelle Obama headed up, the Move Your Way, which really gets at a lot of the things I talked about, letting people know there are many ways to be physically active. And so it's um, it just is taking so much continued effort among so many groups to really get people to be doing active transporters and to um, walk in their communities. And so in terms of what doesn't work is, I think just telling people, you just should be more active. You just should do this for your own benefit. You really do have to persuade them using multiple 
techniques. And I think storytelling is an excellent one to do that. So just telling people, it's just like telling your kids, don't do that or do that. You know, it's just not enough. We just have to approach it from so many different angles. Other uh, other thoughts, Tom or Jorge, on what you think might work, but what actually doesn't work or doesn't work as well as you thought? Uh, I mean, again, it's it's a understanding what the objective of the communication is um, and uh, and knowing who your audience of that communication is very clearly. So something that might want to rally the troops um, of the already persuaded will probably not work. Uh, necessarily for the people on the further end of the spectrum. So kind of to what Jorge was presenting, um, you know, a strong anti-car message is not going to work to the people that you're close to turning because they generally drive cars. A lot of us drive cars, so there's no no sense. You need to build bridges. So a lot of the time, if you feel so passionate about something, and especially in the street space where it is extremely frustrating and it's, it's life-threatening, so we get very passionate about it and you want to speak and scream about it, because it's such a disaster out there, as everybody knows. But you have to rein it in. You've got to put kid gloves on, and, and sometimes watch you, watch how you communicate things, depending on what the outcome um, you're looking for and what the desired outcome is. There's a time and place to scream and shout and and show the disaster that is our streets. But there's also a time and place to reach across the aisle and speak to our commonalities as humans. That's interesting. One of the as a as a candidate, one of the things I was was told was that you you rarely get people from no to yes they have to go through undecided first and so right. move them to, yeah yeah um so kind of campaign advice uh, on that um jorge your thoughts on things that you think might work but then didn't didn't quite work sure like, like i think a rule that is important is never take it personal you know I know that I talked about the protagonist and the antagonist, but in fiction, it could work, you know, like Batman versus the Joker. But in real life, um, if you take it personal, you are losing the battle. Uh, that's why it's important to make these characters. That, that's why I made the elephant and, and Mr. Wheeler. That is like goofy in a cartoon that if you know, you, you can see that cartoon in YouTube with Mr. Wheeler and Mr. Walker, it's, it's amazing. So that's why it's important to have like fictional characters. Also, in, in my short film, I'm using a bulldozer as the, as the antagonist, you know, because you cannot go like against the mayor or against a neighbor uh, because you are losing a battle. It's not you against me. It's me and you against the problem. So never take it personal. Like you, you will lose a lot of people if you take things personal. It's, it's, it, the, the, the problem is the streets, not the people. You know, there's another, this brings up an issue too of, of, well, you, Tom, you mentioned being relatable as an issue and, and Jorge, you spoke about the messenger being the issue. And, and I was also just struck by the comment you had about the framing we have about kind of the normality of driving as the frame, that even the opponents, even the proponents of something different get stuck in that frame. But, um, in the state of Washington, there are some really great advocates who point out that 25% of the public doesn't have a driver's license. Either their children, their seniors, their uh, they don't have the ability to drive because of physical disability or vision or the like, um, as well as people who don't have the economic means to own a car and drive. So your thoughts on how do we you know create space to tell the stories of those with disabilities or those excluded from the driving public and yet be relatable or you know or thoughts on how we can do better at that um and i guess i'm also showing what i believe is to be a weakness of our field and I'm, i've been guilty of it thinking you have the answer when you don't really have the answer and you need to bring other you know voices and concerns to the fore so any any thoughts on that from folks? Um, Jorge, in your work for LA Walks, what are you guys doing to try to bring different voices into the discussion? I think you're muted, Jorge. All right, now you can hear me. Yeah, I, I have some thoughts about it, Mike, because you know, car dependency, it's also car dependency for the low income people. 
You know, it's yeah. a huge burden for the people. We have to emancipate ourselves from car slavery. Um, we need like multimodal systems in our cities to have walkable, bikeable communities and take a high quality public transit. And you were talking about people with disabilities. In, 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 in all my films, I try always to represent people with disabilities. Because if we build a city for people with disabilities, we're building a city for, for everyone, you know? And uh, yeah, so, so that's why it's important always to have representation in, in our messages, to represent, to represent the people so they can identify with the message. Yeah, I would say just to, to add on to that too, I mean, depending on what, what the campaign um, that's being executed on, as long as the voices are represented at the table, um, that's that's really what you need is you need that input from those people to be to be at the table. Um, so, I mean, a lot of that can be done with one, obviously just reaching out to the community um, and bringing people to have those discussions before a campaign goes. Um, but it's also something you can do as far as research and, and, and really not just listening, not just hearing the voices, but listening to the voices, because there's a big difference that we, many of us lose sight of. We hear things, but we don't properly listen. And that's- You mentioned, that's you mentioned research, Tom. Tell me, about, what do you mean when you say research? Tell me about research. Like, what, I, for, for, from my perspective, I say I'm not a research person <laughs> generally, but I just mean literally reaching out and asking people. That's the research, on the ground research I would be speaking to and talking to organizations that uh, represent the people that you'd like to be uh, inclusive of and the stakeholders yeah. that have voices in those communities. Now, I presume that as a car advertiser, you had access to a lot of research, I'm guessing. Yeah, we had tons of demographic and psychographic information to, to, to pull from. Very, very, I guess, lucky that way. Um, so. But I mean, in the advocacy space, there's some generalities that we can we can pull from as well. I mean, if we don't have the budgets to do, you know, hundreds of thousand dollars of research, we can generally kind of get into the minds of the people we're trying to reach. Um, I think anyone that's spent enough time in the advocacy world, and that's many people that have spent a lot more than I have, um, but we generally know what the opposition is feeling and what their sentiment is around as soon as we start discussing shared spaces and spaces for people outside of the car we know the pushback that's coming it's not a surprise it's i mean maybe this is my experience i won't speak for everybody but it's it's um it's almost boilerplate with the way it comes back you know what's going to be said you know what's going to be pushed in council you know what's going to happen um so it's without digging too much into research about how what messages are going to come back um, you could be more. Um, you could spend more time more efficiently crafting the messages. Yeah, I'm. I'm struck by that because because Marion, what's nice about what the the work of the Physical Activity Alliance is is they're investing in research. So we really, yeah, we really are. And um, even though, like I said, we were hoping to get a silver bullet out of it, um, I think that we will be getting some really great strategies once they start to now test the things that we have found and to really look at some ways to break through what, what is going on for public and policymaker to nudge people. And to your point earlier about inclusion, in a campaign that I worked on, we really did try to include in the visuals, of course, um, so many groups and people of varying levels of ability. So it's just really important that the visuals include that. I, I I brought up research for a reason because I, I guess I had started out as when as an advocate, you know, we developed our message by sitting around a table and arguing with the, with each other about what we thought was the best message, and then when I got to run for office was the or run actually before that it was run ballot measure campaigns, um, I actually had access to research, focus group and polling research, and I have to say it was. Um, kind of mind-blowing to learn what words worked and what didn't and it really changed my own mind and made me more humble in my own opinion about what would work like we did a parks levy and i can still recite to you the best tested message as seattle continues to grow and become more dense we need parks and open spaces to 
um, enhance our quality of life. That was the best tested message and we used it incessantly because it was the best message. And it wasn't exercise and it wasn't seniors and it wasn't the environment. It was about quality of life in the face of growth was the message. And like I said, that, that taught me a lot of humility about that, we, that maybe we don't know the right message um, when we start a campaign, we just think we know the right message. That is um, so important. And we learned that so much on a, a big national campaign that I worked on for kid physical activity. And we just, again and again, especially as public health, which is my background too, we assume that we do know what is going to work. But until you ask people, it's like what Tom said about knowing your audience. Um, our audience was kids and we would show our, our visuals, our ads, and we had multiple web pages and all kinds of things. And the adults were like, oh, I, I'm not sure that I really get that. And again and again, our creative people had to say, it's not about what you think is working. It's what the kids think is working. And the kids liked this. So, you know, back off. We trust that the, that the audience is going to tell us what works. So it's such an important point. Yeah, so so if you don't have a budget, let's let's dig into this then. If you're a if you're trying to craft a good message and you don't have any budget because you're a bunch of people sitting around a table trying to figure out how to get a crosswalk, how would you do how would you do your research? How would you get a better message than simply trust your gut that you know what's best? I see you smiling, Tom. And that's no, you know, yeah. that's that's many of us, frankly. I I, I don't have a, a a silver bullet for that one either. I mean, that comes down to your lived experience where you are in your neighborhood and your relationships with people that are just outside of your neighborhood as well. So I think that's just talking to the people that that are that are stakeholders in the space um, and, and reaching out to the people that will be affected if this if this goes in. That's as that's as much research as you that, that I can do, <laughs> to be totally honest. Jorge, I see you nodding your head on this one as well. Sure, yeah. You just need to go out to the streets and talk with the people, to, with your community, listen to them. You know, I think that's uh, that's one of my biggest mistakes I, when I'm doing like storytelling. Like, I, I have to work a lot in my listening skills to listen to people because they have they are the experts. They have the familiar experience in the streets. So, so it's very important to be a good listener, um, and 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 then. Um, with that information, you can craft your messages for the people and not from only your mind. It's, it's like a collective uh, message because it comes from everyone. Yeah, no, I I, I think that, it, I, I guess I wanted to hit this point. Thank you all for hitting it too. That don't, I think sometimes we get mystified by message too, right? And that that for your typical advocate, experimentation and listening uh practice and experimentation with messages will is your research and you'll continually work on it yeah i, I have another thing I, <laughs> I have another thing i think you can always tell if someone's a leader um do they have followers so you can. <laughs> i think you can always tell if you have a message that's working are people repeating it are people are people thought are people embracing it and and using it is 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 your test uh as potentially a way to is a way to go at that one um I, do you guys have questions for each other that from watching each other's presentation that you wanted to jump in on as well yeah Hi. um oh go ahead dory uh, no, sorry. Like we are talking about listening to the people, so, but I don't know if if the audience has have some questions from us for, for, or comments. You know, they're, they're coming in. They're coming in through the chat, and I've been trying to integrate some of these into the questions I've been asking you as well. So, All right. um, yeah, it, we've got that. So, um, and there's a bunch of different questions, and and I've, I've hit a, I've hit a few of them, but not all of them. Tom, you said you had a question. Yeah, I was just wondering, Jorge, some of like your biggest challenges in convincing people to kind of share your thoughts and ideas on how our spaces should be. Like, what 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 are some of the biggest challenges you faced, like tangibly? Yes, I, I think that the, the status quo is very powerful. 
you know, it, it's it's really difficult to 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 make people to imagine the streets in a different way. Uh, it's really difficult to go to the to a crosswalk and start to make, uh, you know, sidewalk expansions, bollards, um, bikeways, you know, to, to start to build these multimodal streets because people, they have a lot of opinions and it's very difficult to convince them. So, so that's one of the, the challenges of the governments. I think that they, they spend all the budget in, in, in making a project, but they don't spend budget like communicating and doing outreach with people or workshops with the people. I mean, like, like uh, uh, we need people to, to, to appropriate the project. So if we make a good uh, participatory process with the people before implementing the project, it will be the, it, it will be the project of the people. You know, maybe we will not convince everyone, but we will convince enough people to make the project happen with the people for the people. You know, so so one, one but that's one of the main problems that the the, the governments and organizations they, they don't spend budget doing these participatory processes, and we need to do this. <laughs> these processes without budget and it's very difficult like with our own time and with our own resources to go with the people talk with them so i think that that's really important like uh, it, always 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 have a budget for communications and for the participatory process if you if you want to do a project in the streets you know one of uh, one of the questions that's come out of the the chat is how do we deal with the fact that when as advocates that the professionals tell us what is best in the street. How do you, you know, any thoughts on how do you counteract that message? I, I, for, I, oh yeah, so I, it's, that's a tough one because it's really like, I completely respect people's expertise in their, in their field and their departments and what they're doing. So I think when, and if it's, it's challenging because we're, we're living those experiences on the roads that are being designed by professionals. Um, so I think they're in such a tough position that I, I imagine they're in such a tough position and pressure from the city to build the streets as the city wants them to build. So yeah, it's, it's, I don't think I have an answer. I'm just kind of rambling here, but I, I'm thinking it's, it's very, it's just important to respect that position and that work. Um, the, the, the issue is just so systemic. Um, I mean, this has been years and years of building up our streets and our neighborhoods designed around the automobile. So it's so deeply ingrained. I don't think I'm answering the question well, but to, to me, the way in is through the people that live in the spaces. And if the people that live in the spaces are supportive, then they will bring in uh, leaders and counselors that will be supportive and in turn then can make the changes in the transportation department because it's so it's it's the monumental task to ask a, a transportation engineer to do this because we think it's right without any support in the community or in the leadership circle so yeah I, this is really not a great answer but to me the way in is 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 community first and going up from there no oh, I think that I think that's an answer I think that's an answer I mean, I think a related question is, um, I mean, that, that springs out of that question is the idea that we've become, and you've said this already, we've become so used to the idea of driving as the norm and, and the other things are the things that are supposed to fit in around the edges, as opposed to, you know, account, actually accommodating walking and biking and people of all ages and abilities in, in the space. That one is really particularly hard in the suburbs. Did you know? Have you guys and Marion? I'm thinking. Did you notice any difference in attitudes when you were looking, or were you able to look at urban versus suburban attitudes as a as something to get at, or or even rural? You know. Actually, the focus groups were done in three uh, urban settings, so I don't think they got a lot of suburbs there. But um, we did um, we did look at some of the non as non-urban media sources and of course as experts and uh, advocates sat or in rural areas and um, you know a, a lot of the same kind of issues and, and of course in rural areas uh, the the absence of a lot of walking trails and things like that is can often be a real problem I mean they may live on a on a, on a very busy highway so 
Um, yeah, we're well aware that that those are different issues. You know, I did have a question. I don't know if we have time, but um, I'm wondering if the people here have, are starting to think about uh, with the stimulus money that is going to be coming into communities. And I've just been reading how transportation people are like, thank goodness we don't have to cut our budgets to nothing. Um, if this is going to be a great opportunity to maybe make some progress on better, uh, you know, walkable streets and streetscapes and complete streets and that kind of thing. Are, are any of you thinking about that? I'll, I'll jump in on that one. I am a lot. I'm thinking about that. And, you know, it actually kind of brings up another way to think about messaging, which is people are so, uh, everybody learns quite a bit about the national debate. It's covered so heavily on the news and elsewhere that that also can frame, frame up how to message. And I think that, um, jobs is going to be a big issue and one of the things we know so here i am going straight to data but maybe we need to visualize this you know to really make it work you know the fact is that people uh building sidewalks or trails or mending streets is more, that's more people working than the construction of a new highway for example which is more machinery than than people so if you want to create jobs that's great if you want to create equity racial equity is a pillar of the biden administration it's one of the three things they picked out in their transition time um they've also picked out climate but but you know and climate is a justice and equity issue as well you know we know that um there are a lot the communities um, you know uh, people of color black people indigenous people are killed on our streets at far higher rates than than others and that's oftentimes because the worst designed streets are in the neighbor in those neighborhoods. So investing in those neighborhoods has a safety and a public health and an equity uh, message as well. So I think, you know, I think that something that's happening, I believe, in this country right now is that there's a sense of where it's going to be more calm than it was previously, and that there's a return to normalcy and government will function again. And and I don't want to Personally, I don't want us to slip into that as the frame. Let's just go back to where it was with less controversy. Mm. Instead, let's try to build on the message of this is an extraordinary opportunity to rebuild and reinvest in a way that builds a future we want. And, and so I personally think that you can piggyback on the messages that are that others are spending lots and lots of money on to, to get your message to go a little bit further. Um, because if you don't have much money, you can't create your own frame in the same way that others can. But if you can grab someone else's frame, that's a good thing. So there, there's my messaging thoughts for the day. Tom or Jorge, you want to jump in on that? I don't have too much to add if we're talking about the, the stimulus package, to be honest, unfortunately. But I would say that um, similar to returning to normal, I mean, we all saw the the transformation of our streets at the outset of of the coronavirus um you know you, you'd see kids out playing you'd see people the bike boom happened it was it was immediate and it was real like this the streets were a place where you could be outside again um and it's i, I don't know about where it is where everyone is for them but for here it's it's almost back to 100 percent normal like we've i feel like there was an opportunity that i know a lot of places did capitalize on which is great but um, we're slowly getting back to our normal uh, where we are right now. And it's it's not 100% doom and gloom. There's still opportunity, but um, it's something that, you know, there's that sense to get back to normal. And that car culture is so, so deep, deeply ingrained in us to get back those streets. I mean, all the car ads that came out in, in April or May were just positioned the same way around kind of we're here to protect you and we're ready to return to normal. That's essentially what most of them were. We're ready to, we're, we're here waiting for you, you know, an engine revving or something. But um, it's, I'm not sure again, how the spaces are where you all are. I'd be actually interested to hear how your, how your situation is there um, post uh, kind of COVID right now. I, I think that's a tremendous point as well, that we did in fact see a change in behavior and, how do we capture that and maintain it and not not return to something else? Jorge, did you want to lean in on that 
messaging in the moment? Your thoughts on, on possibilities now? Sure. Uh, Mike, you, you, you were talking about equity and, and, and climate change. Uh, and it's funny how when, when, we, when, when we are trying to solve these problems, car is in the middle of everything, the cars, you know, and electric cars, they, they could help, but they don't, they are not the answer for our cities. They still have a big space in the cities, like a lot of parking lots in the cities instead of housing for low-income people. So, so, so when we are talking um, about equity for low-income people, for people of color in our cities, it's very important to acknowledge that, car, that cars are a huge problem. So we need to, to, to give this freedom of people to, 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 because there's people that they don't have any other choice than to, to spend a lot of money uh, buying, driving, using a car. So we need choices in the cities, in the suburbs, to have a great public transit system with all this budget that Marianne was talking about. Like, yes, we need this budget to change our cities, to have more alternatives in our cities, especially for, for people of color and low-income people. And, 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 and then we, we can have cars, but not as like right now that cars are kidnapping our cities and it's dangerous and people are dying in the streets and, and we have all these parking lots instead of housing and, you know, so, so that's why it's very important to, 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 to know that cars is only a small tool of all the ecosystem of our, of, of our city. You know, like, like, like we must prioritize walking, biking, transit, and then at the end, a little space for the cars, you know, because cars are also important and a great invention of humanity. And it, it could save us from a lot of things, but it should be in the bottom of everything. First I walk and I save, first I bike, First, I have a great public transit, and then at the end, whatever is left is, 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 is for the cars. Well, you know, talking about the national environment and possibilities for the future seems like a good place to try to bring this to a close. Um, I, I have a, a, a couple of more thoughts. One is we talked about messaging today, but as, as a campaigner, one of the things I've always known is that if you don't have a theory to communicate your message, then your message isn't useful. And I, you know, we live in an era now where um, a tweet can go viral or a Facebook post can go viral. But for the most part, you actually need a distribution strategy to get your message out. And the very first one is just talking to people. So I guess I'm talking to my to the audience here. You know, it's like, do your research, even if you have no money, you can do research test your message by doing it, and then get it out there as far as you can using whatever tools at your disposal. And, and, and one of the other tools for message delivery is getting other people to repeat your message, which is organizing. Um, the more people that you can recruit to your cause, the more messengers you get, and, and the more ability you have to, to reach more people. So I just want to end, um, as Jorge would have it, with a call to action. Don't let the idea that a message is mystifying. We're all storytellers. We all have the ability to, to reach people and, and add people. We all have the ability to listen and we can all do the research. So with that, we're gonna close. And again, um, slides are up. Thank you to all our sponsors. We're really grateful to the Centers for Disease Control and, uh, and Prevention and, and our other sponsors for supporting this program. We, of course, if you like this, we at America Walks, we want to be a voice for walkable communities. We want to hit the issues that we have spoken about, about uh, mobility for all, mobility justice, racial equity, fighting, uh, you know, working for, uh, to prevent climate change, uh, creating more jobs with our investment infrastructure and getting those jobs to the people that need them most. We have no shortage of arguments as to why we can do good and we uh, we can always improve our messaging. All of us can always improve our messaging. And one of the ways we get more message delivery is more dollars from you. Your dollars help spread the message. So please, if you enjoy these, consider making a donation, You know, be on our mailing list, and follow up with us. Let us know what you're doing in your community. If you have a good story, we want to tell your story. We want to share your story with other people. 
And of course, thank you to our guests. This was really, really informative. I feel um, like a better messenger already. Thank you everybody for joining us.